All right, hi guys. Uh, so thank you for joining me today at the uh, presentation that I'm delivering for empowering content managers using business principles. Just as to start, I'd like to thank Drupal Mode for organizing this, getting people that come and talk about stuff that they're passionate for web. Uh, it's always nice to get to mingle and share knowledge. Um, so yeah, so this presentation, the title could be ambiguous, and it kind of is a remix of the presentation I had presented at um, Drupal Ottawa earlier this year. And uh, during the presentation, I had some comments with people saying, like, you, just, you can't say no to leadership. Um, it's difficult. Uh, how do you negotiate with clients? And I kind of tried to get to go back a step and try to figure out, like, how did I come up with this solution with workflows and negotiating deliverables and kind of getting at that attitude. So after digging a bit, I figured, hey, I have a business background. This is not typical with um, content managers necessarily. So I, could, I kind of started doing some marketing. Uh, I got a become marketing, did marketing communications for a number of years, fell in love with web, and then went into a full web position, went to the registrar. All this is in the context of the University of Ottawa. So that was managing about 20% of the web traffic um, at the university. A lot of volume, um, a, lot of, a lot of deliverables. And then I wanted something a bit closer to my first love, which was marketing. So then now I'm at the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Ottawa. I'm um, a strategist in web content management and design. And um, I'm within a marketing and communications team, so things go fast. Um, web's not my only priority. I have a social media hat. Uh, do some graphic design, help out with events. So there's a lot of stuff. Um, and this presentation is not for people who necessarily just work in marketing and communications team, but it's, I'm, I'm hoping to inspire you to um, help you with decision models and negotiate with your managers and directors to collaborate to get to your goals. Um, and yeah, my next tile is probably going to be even longer. I'm probably going to have an even more diversified uh, <laughs> number of responsibilities. But um, yeah, all of you, I'm sure, work on projects, all of you manage, and by manage, I don't mean just content, you probably might have um, people that you supervise, either fit formally or just can, like editors, so you have to manage your content, make sure that the quality control is part of your job, sorry, um, operations, and basically, like I said earlier, everything else, so helping out with these GMI tables during presentations and whatnot. So we talked about titles. Yeah, so when you get a job, you get a title, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those are your responsibilities. And what I want to say today is you're more than your title. You're more than just an employee. Um, you're an expert, basically. You're an expert and you should be heard. Um, And I'm going to show you a bit of frameworks and tools on like how to approach problems and hopefully when you get to get to those decisions, you can be like, ah, oh, yeah, I saw this at uh, Drupal North, this uh, decision model. So I want you to be a leader and with leadership you get respect. By being vocal, you'll be advising your team. By positioning yourself as an expert, you'll be sought after. By being resourceful, you're going to be trusted. And by being proactive, you're going to be approachable. Um, so I was talking about bringing some business principles. I know a lot of content managers usually come from the technical stream. Your developer, maybe, maybe your designer. Um, but back onto the business side, I was just trying to think, hey, maybe I'll start with the higher level stuff. So I'm going to go with organizational behavior. And I like my puns, so I'm going to go with a B theme. So organizational behavior, or as we say in business, just OB. Um, yeah, so ask yourself, what's the prime objective of your organization? I know a couple of you have attended the presentation before, so don't spoil it. Um, but uh, it is a trick question because all of your objectives, or the prime objective of your organizations are all the same. It's to survive. So what is survival? Um, you can't manage your content. You won't have the cash flow to pay your employees. There's no way that you're gonna um, get to your, your mission values or your objectives because basically business is key. And if you can get 
to talk business, you can get in line with your leadership and get eye to eye and basically um, put the web on the map when it comes to uh, operations. Yeah, so this is kind of a more like friendly approach to survival. Um, yeah, so now that we know the main, the main prime objective of your organization, ask yourself, how will you ensure that your organization survives or thrives with your work? So like, what do you bring to your organization? So like, how are you gonna help it either uh, pivot or how are you gonna help it persevere during crunch times and avoid your company or organization perish? So when it comes to goal alignment, um, if you haven't already done this exercise, try to figure out exactly like the value of what, how, how do you help your organization in terms of mission. So what's your, like, what's your team's mission? If you work in a, a bigger organization, what's your department's mission? Um, what's your organization's mission? And then compare that to the competition. Like, how do you align? How can you collaborate? And then how do you compete? And then, um, yeah, find out what value you and others contribute to the organization. So like, does your team have in-house expertise for uh, theming or uh, user interface? Like, how do you find that? Uh, how do you find people who are really good at editing and grammar or like have access to those style guides in, in your organization? So by finding out which teams have those strengths, it's easier to collaborate. I'm aware this is high level. We're going to get a bit more into the nitty gritty. So on the B team, like figure out where your high is at. Um, and then for web, for survival, there's the organizational part of the survival, but there's also the individual side. So with web, there could be this feeling of a caretaker's guilt, like this is my website, I'm responsible for this. If, if we don't have 100% uptime, how are the users gonna access the content? Um, what I'm trying to say here is, um, content is a, a, almost like a village. You need the editors that come in, you need the content owners who are gonna supply you the content, who are gonna flag you and say like, hey, this content is no longer up to date, like this event was last year. Um, you have to have the developers who support you with security, with the platform, um, so don't, um, don't put it all on yourself. The other part is also remember your realm of influence. Sometimes when there's, let's say, a security breach, there's only so much that you can do when it comes to um, content management, so it's finding those resources, but also uh, not to stress too much about it because, once again, it's team sport. The other part is take some breaks. If you burn out, so if you work at 100% for an extended period of time and then work at 0% because you can't manage it anymore, overall the efficiency would probably be better if you worked at 80% and uh, made sure that you um, take your time to accomplish your goals on the long term. And I'll talk more about stress in a couple of minutes. The other part is it's okay to fail sometimes and to learn from your lessons. The important part is obviously to share those lessons um, and to acknowledge like when you fail. And finally, uh, reducing the stresses with the new control. So stress is good, but too much of it can make you burn out. Um, so about 12 years ago, I spoke to a vice president at Xerox, and um, we were talking about organizational behaviors. And he said, I want to stress my employees. And to me, that was kind of um, an odd comment. And what he was talking about or referring to was your stress. So it's kind of this optimal spot when it comes to um, motivation. The reason why you would want to stress your employees is um, you don't want them to be bored or underwhelmed, unmotivated, but you don't want them to be too stressed so that they uh, get anxiety attacks and get overwhelmed. So there's a this fine balance, and when I'm talking about stress, it can apply to yourself, but also your, uh, your web team. So like, how can you motivate people to want to have more engagement with um, either like your updates, like, hey, there's an update, like you should probably, this, this is the value that's bringing to the organization. On a more visual perspective, basically, like, let's say your, your team is on a boat. If you're not motivated enough, you don't reach as much of performance. Um, you can get close to it, and that's probably okay. But if you go overboard, um, all the ship crashes, or at least some of, the, some of your teammates go overboard, and then you have to go and pick them up. So, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, just trying to give you some mental imagery about how, to, how stress could be perceived. Another way to manage stress within your control is to control your environment to a certain degree. Uh, so my friend who works at the uh, National Arts Center, he kind of introduced me to this concept of a nook. So making your work environment as comfortable as possible. So this could mean um, decorations, adding some color, uh, enhancing your light. So if you're looking at documentation or wireframing, if you can see what you're working on or refer to it, it's a lot easier to design. Um, getting some ergonomics, some chairs that actually fit properly, so you don't have to worry about how your legs are feeling when you're focus, focused on your work. Um, and on the left, it's my, um, I have a static work environment, um, and on the right, that's my home. So I'm, you can see that there's kind of like um, a recreation of like that, that comfort level, that uh, what I find comfortable, at, at, at the very least. And yes, I do have an Apple keyboard with a Windows computer, but I won't get into that. <laughs> I have my reasons. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we talked about uh, nooks. So your own comfort, but then there's um, having new employees. So when you're a newbie, if you're an employee, it takes about three to six months to get uh, to understand the nature of your work, uh, the reality of your web, what the operational cycles are going to be looking like. And then if you're management or leadership, more information, bigger iceberg of uh, responsibilities, you're looking at about six, to, six months to a year to get them to your position or comfortable. So, when you're the newbie, this is your window of opportunity for making an impact. So getting those quick wins, those low hanging fruits, showing, hey, I understood the problem, I solved it. I'm getting some credentials and some, um, some credibility in terms of, like, I, I understand what, you're, like, trust me, I want to collaborate with you. And this uh, is a good way to that showcase other people that work in web, like, oh yeah, this person gets it, I want to collaborate with this person. So you're kind of like, hey, I'm new. Same thing with leadership, except um, with leadership, this is a good time to come in and uh, say, okay, sir, if, if somebody else is new, like if somebody else is um, in, coming in in a leadership position, uh, this is a good way to advocate for your agenda. So go for a coffee, say like, hey, this is the reality of the web, plant that seed right away, so later on, when it's, there's like next year, this person knows exact, exactly who you are, what you're doing, and you don't have to um, ask for a hard sell or soft sell. You already have that relationship built up. Um, when it's a new employee that comes into the fold, that's when you can uh, kind of gauge their, their expertise level. Like, okay, you understand CSS, you know JavaScript. Okay, uh, well, this is my por like portfolio. Like, you, can you help me out with this? And in exchange, I'll help. Uh, manage your website section a bit better, faster, like let's find something that works for both of us. So it's, it's just like getting in touch faster with people so you don't um, wait till the last minute to ask for favors. Self-understanding will give you wings. Um, so how do you communicate with others? Are you direct in your emails? Are you catering to their emotions? How do you process information? Are you tactile? Are you visual? Are you auditory? So how do you learn? What drives you? In my case, uh, I love wireframing. I like designing. I like uh, taking an idea, conceptualizing it, and spitting it back onto the web in a seamless experience. What distracts you? Is it that third email from somebody that sent you the same request on the same day, and then they follow up with a phone call? Is it that question that you get asked by the editor? Is it an H2 header that should have been an H3 header? And can you work on all that? Then flip it around. So how would your colleagues communicate with each other? Are they direct? Are they nuanced? Do they have a different approach? Are they going to try to come around, pitch you an idea, come back later? How do they process information? What drives them? How do you get somebody excited about your, your, your content projects? What do you know they're going to stumble upon? Are they going to get obsessive about a certain element? And can you work on helping them out with this? Food for thought. So to me, I'm talking about business today, but um, 
I understand that there's a bit more, at least this is what I think is um, useful traits for shelling out good content. There's the business side, so business awareness. You don't need to be a business person. Uh, there's the people skills, because content is made by people. There's the technical competence and design curiosity. So elaborating or digging a bit deeper with um, communication styles, what's, what's your comfort area? So for me, I started in business, and I'm kind of working my way into the design of technology, but do you have a technical background? So when you use jargon, like for acronyms, is it the same acronym as in business? Is it the same acronym as in design? So when you say UI or AI, are they talking about artificial intelligence? Are they talking about art information architecture? I'm sorry, that's a terrible example, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, so like, yeah, are those acronyms or language or approaches the same? Are you starting with a user-centric approach? Are you looking for a tool-first approach, something that's rigid, robust, or are you just talk, like thinking about money at the bottom line? Um, so something I like is to do some uh, self-improvement. I'm a huge sucker for it. I've done, taken a lot of workshops. I've taken a lot of, of workshops for management and supervision and uh, accessibility and all that fun stuff. Well, what I find to be fun stuff. Um, and one of the tests is the Myers-Briggs test. So this one's free. It's called uh, 16 Personalities. It takes about 15 minutes to do. Um, and at the end, they spew out a personality or a, a type uh, or stereotype that they think fits best for you. So in my case, I've been fluctuating mostly towards the logician, so introverted, intuition, thinking, etc. cetera. Um, and it highlights what they think is strengths or weaknesses of, of your personality, but also your working styles. If your team feels comfortable, I would recommend maybe doing that as a team exercise. I'll spend 15 minutes and then have a good laugh about like, oh, the, um, well, the cartoon looks funny, but yeah, I can totally relate to this person. Um, and then you can see where those gaps are for uh, communication styles. Kind of, oh yeah, I'm totally like design first, or um, I'll totally think about concepts before thinking about how people feel. Great, so you're energized. You're a self-aware expert. Now what? So <laughs> we've talked a lot about theory. Let's go a bit more theoretical, uh, a bit more in uh, the details. Uh, buzz with your energy. So. When are your peaks? I'm sure you know your peaks. Um, so like Brian was saying earlier, he's an early bird. I'm definitely not an early bird. <laughs> are you a lunch crow? Do you work during the lunch time when everybody's gone so you can actually get stuff done? Are you an evening owl? Um, and then when you know those peaks, like, oh yeah, I'm really, like, I'm really feeling energized right now, what should you do with that? Personally, what I've, what I've been kind of developing is um, going for the conceptual and strategic stuff, stuff that thinks a lot of, takes a lot of energy to, um, to get things done. So like earlier, yesterday, Paul um, Labs were, was talking about like developing a content style guide. That's the time to do it. You're taking all those considerations of your organization and trying to cram it down in one, into one document or one page. Yeah, put that effort into that. So high level stuff, when you're a bit more tired, Go for designing, the creative stuff, the learning, still using some energy, um, but not being brain dead or just exhausted. So like tinkering, adjusting those widgets, those alignments, maybe slight CSS. And when you're super tired or exhausted or you can't think further, do the repetitive stuff, the dreaded stuff. Go find those dead links, erase them, right? Uh, change the labels of your aliases for URLs. Like, doesn't take too much thinking power and just do it. If, if you spend your energy here planning, what you could do is plan for when you're tired. So that's an idea. Um, and finally, structure some time for unstructured time. By that I mean technology is always evolving, there's always new stuff, there's always the platform is changing, there's always new modules. Um, so earlier I was talking about not always working at 100%. Save 10% of your time for learning. Save 10% of your time for going out for coffees and meeting those newbies. And uh, yeah, you can justify that with business objectives. So do the most of your daytime. Um, don't try any new recipes that require a lot of energies when you're in crunch time. You should focus on the critical path. Um, 
that a principle I like is the Pareto principle. So if 20% of your efforts give you 80% of the impact, what the hell is the other 80% that you have? So recently what we did is a content strategy analysis. I did a deep dive into your content, uh, looked at your news article at the University of Ottawa, Faculty of Engineering, and uh, kind of identified like, oh wow, these articles are getting a lot of engagement. Like this person, there are a lot of people who are spending four months on this article versus this article. Or we had a few clicks, then they'll have a lot of time on them. So like, how do you eliminate that so you can maximize your impact in terms of content writing? Be selfish about context change. By that I mean um, minimize the distractions. I like to focus on my work. And then if something distracts you, that's when the context changes from what you were focused on. That has a, that has a cost and energy. Um, so there's two ways to go about it. It's either minimize that so you can work outside of the office or just say, like, this is my busy hat. Or you can uh, reschedule with people and say, like, hey, no, okay, I, I got your idea. I wrote it down. Or send me an email and um, I can't think about it right now because I'm trying to focus. Um, and then if you have difficult decisions that, are, um, that you're hum-hawing, it's not necessarily only up to you to do the decision. You can always throw into your, your manager's court or your director's court. Um, and managers do decision, decisions all the time, so they have an aptitude for slicing the cake and giving you some directions. All right, project management. Um, so for everything that you do, as a fun exercise, try to consider putting all your efforts within this triangle. How much time is it going to take you? How much resources, or how many resources is this work going to take you? And how many people or efforts is this going to take you? So I know this developer named Sean, uh, Sean Boots, and he made this app for fun um, to calculate how much a government meeting costs. So you can put a couple of generals into the app, you can put a couple of uh, director generals, uh, some clerks. It tallies how many employees are in the uh, meeting, and it skews out the salary for the hour that was spent. So you can look at the meetings. When, whenever you have a meeting discussion for a button, let's say, on your website, how much did this button conversation cost me? Five hundred dollars is that a good is that a good amount of time spent for a button decision? Maybe. So try to look at it on yeah more of a financial than effort perspective. Another thing I really like is an Eisenhower matrix. This is really good for uh, prioritization. Um, I'm fortunate that my manager is very open to new concepts, and we've applied this for for meetings. So this avoids a town hall meeting. Um, it avoids having the web last within a meeting or your portfolio last in a meeting. And the way it works is really um, with two axes. So urgent, not urgent, important, not important. So whatever is urgent, uh, so timely and important, you do it right away. Anything that is not urgent or important, you plan. Not important but urgent, you delegate. That's my favorite. So you can get to that. <laughs> not because I don't want to do it, but it also gives experience for whoever else is um, taking on those responsibilities. And it gives you a bit of clout in terms of uh, supervision leadership. Um, and uh, not urgent, not important, you can eliminate it, put it in your back burner, or just revise it later. Maybe it's going to bubble up. Obviously, um, that's also just a small gap. caveat. It's by impact. So if you have something that is low, like tiny but urgent important, and there's something else that is huge and urgent important, like obviously the huge thing should, or anything that has like a big project or critical passion, be taken into consideration first. So far, so good. I know I speak a bit fast. <laughs> and I'm not going through the slide fast enough. All right, leading by interaction. That's the um, management principle. So let's say we have a scenario where I have this content update that is required, and I have um, this client or editor that needs to do the update. Um, this is kind of like a mental um, scenario of how to present the information. So you get ready present the information, you come in with self-confidence about your ask, you come in with empathy, you're participative, it's not top-down, you come in with a communication and a supportive um, approach, and then you clarify, so like here's the presentation, that here's the update that I need from you to do, these are the deadlines that, that are um, part of the, the work, this is the impact that's going to happen, and this is, these are the stakeholders, 
So you can clarify, you develop, you have a, a conversation like, oh no, wait, this person actually has a competing kind of uh, uh, update going on, they have to work on this, this social media post. So you develop it until you get to an understanding and then they ship 100% of the time. Not really. Uh, <laughs> so um, if they don't ship, if it's not shipped properly, what happens is you can go back to clarifying. So like, oh, I thought we had this understanding. Ha what happened? Um, go back with self-confidence, like this is what we have to do. Um, and you just keep doing that cycle until they conclude. This is a bit heavier. Um, <laughs> so management does come into a valve. So the more autonomous somebody is, the more that they ship, the looser the valve, the more control that you give to the person. If they don't deliver, if they're not uh, respecting the deadlines or um, basically not being a team player, tighten that valve. Um, so this is a situ like a, a situational leadership um, scenario. In summary, y-axis is a supportive behavior on the behalf of the leader or yourself. And on the x-axis, the task behavior is like how directive you are. Um, very quickly, basically, Pink is somebody that's able, motivated, that wants to shell out the work. So that's like your ideal employee. You don't have a lot of those. And basically, you can give them a, a project and they're going to go and run with it and they don't need support. Afterwards, you have the, the blue or R3. Uh, it's somebody that's competent, able, but needs good guidance. So they're kind of like, oh, this is, I'm not necessarily comfortable with this, or like, how, how, how do I, like, how do I get around it? So you need to get good support. Afterwards, you have this person who's very eager, so uh, often it's newbies, or in our case, it's admin staff who are, you know, like, I love web, but I have, I have no idea how to do it. <laughs> so uh, you need to give them a bit more training. Uh, the, the enthusiasm is there, but the technical expertise is not um, built yet. So like how to, how to write excessively for the web. That, that would be that part. And then the green are the employees who are not motivated, not competent yet. And that's where you have the control of that at the tightest, so you have to um, almost like it, they're going to take a lot of your time in terms of uh, supervision. So if we kind of put a parallel of uh, Drupal permissions in terms of uh, content management, then a, a, a paid employee would probably get webmaster level access or um, higher level so they can actually do some, uh, some layouts. A blue employee could maybe have that, but you'd have to have maybe more of a check-in or revision kind of model. Orange employee, editor, or contributor, and then green, maybe no access because they will just destroy your pages and <laughs> your healthy website yeah, ecosystem is going to go down. Um, so in my case, uh, at our faculty, we have employees of all types, and I do have some people or stakeholders or people that you just simply don't give access because they haven't respected the understanding that we had in the past. Um, yeah, so we talked about um, delegation. Now, for yourself, everybody works in the digital age. Everybody has emails, phones, chat groups, hopefully. We started at the university having our own chat groups, um, and obviously in person. Um, what I like to do is be predictable, so standardizing the uh, amount of time that they can expect to have a response from me. So if, let's say the dean sends me an update, obviously they're in priority, but if they send me an email, they can expect to have a reply within 48 hours all the time. If they give me a phone call and I'm available, I'll pick up the phone. If they come in person, I'll talk to them or reschedule. And why I want to be predictable is when somebody comes with an ask. They know exactly what to expect and they won't try to bypass the system. So like, for example, somebody comes with a project they send me an email, it doesn't work, and then they call me right away. That's not being very respectful for A, for my time, and for two, it's almost like harassment, but um, you also want to be respectful for everybody else who are using proper channels for, for doing some requests. Um, so that kind of ties into the, the aspect of like rewarding those who ship. So um, it, you want to reward people who ship on time, but also respect your time. So if somebody um, is always delivering on time, you can kind of schedule your time a bit better to, to get your, your workflow going. Um, favors do foster collaboration. 
And by that, that's kind of like what I was alluding to when we talked about newbies. So you do a favor, put it into to their deposit box. Oh, okay, you gave me a favor, so I'm gaining a bit of trust with you. They're gonna do a favor for you, put that in your favor box, I guess. And then when you, when you build that uh, type of capacity collaboration, usually uh, flowers. Starting to run out of time. Okay, and um, yeah, so the idea with collaboration is the more people that you can get on board and to collaborate, the more you're gonna be able to influence uh, the web agenda. For example, at the University of Ottawa, we're in a decentralized system. All the webmasters are uh, in faculties or services, and being alone can be kind of lonely, and we all have our struggles, but when we get together and talk about something collaboratively, we recognize that there are like um, opportunities for growth, for improvement, streamlining um, tools, um, and we can also all want together to push for um, our agenda with leadership. So by kind of creating those, that collaborative aspect of, um, of the needs together, there's, there, it, it does elevate everybody at the same time. Um, technology has changed and changes management. So we, um, one of the presentations from yesterday was talking about how um, machine learning can figure out um, your emotions within, within words. So that's kind of creepy. For me, it's creepy cool, but not everybody in, um, at least for my team, we're in marketing and communications. Our marketing and uh, communications coordinator could be uh, kind of sketched up with the web. So it's your responsibility to be the, that little change management person in your team that says, hey, web is cool. Hey, this is the impact that web is bringing. And you have to clarify that because um, it could be ambiguous. So I have a friend, Jason, who loves to doodle. And whenever there's something complicated or new happening, when you doodle it up, it makes it a lot easier to understand the change. And it takes away the uh, resistance and brings everybody on board. OK, so I presented a lot of um, models today. Um, and hopefully, it's going to give you some ideas of setting boundaries to say yes or no to requests, to say yes or no to delegation, yes or no to management. Um, yeah, so as a recap, we talked about understanding the mission of the organization, of your teams, how to feel energized, consider how you communicate, um, write your energy waves, some approaches to management, um, and being predictable and a team player in terms of collaboration. Yeah, so alone you're a web practitioner, but together we're a cohesive colony with a much wider, wider range of skills. And I want, once again, to reiterate, you're more than your title, you're a leader, you're an expert, and you should be heard during your meetings. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any comments? Does any of this resonate with you? Do you have any like, oh yeah, this person's definitely like a pink employee, green employee? <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment on the work environment. Sure. What do you do when you, you don't have control over your work environment? For example, we have offices that are open area, it's very loud. Mm -hmm. There's not even walls to put stuff up to okay. create any personalization. People are always weak. Like, we're at least getting five walk ins a day that we didn't have before. Okay. So I'm strategy on that. Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Um, for, for me, at, at least like with obviously like the physical environment, it's kind of a tough one, but at least for the walk-in parts, you can set up standards. Um, and that's kind of like bringing back the, the aspect of self-confidence, um, where you, you, you can say no to people and say like, okay, well, this is my busy hour. Um, I had that in the past. Um, there's, I guess, two strategies that come up to mind. The first one is to have it in your calendar, so like block off the time when you focus on, on work. Um, <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and the other one is just like, look at, it's, it's, it's getting them to, to bounce back, so like scheduling sometimes. So like right now, not a good time. I will schedule you later, or I'll schedule you, uh, sorry, sorry, I'll schedule you now for later, or let's reevaluate that um, during another meeting. So kind of like having like a block of time, and usually people are kind of responsive when you say like, I'm gonna dedicate this amount of time with you. 
um, Cavit. If it's something that's not important or urgent, you can just say like, a, <laughs> I'll talk to my management and we'll get back to you to see if that's, that aligns with my responsibilities. So you can kind of use all, like juggle through all those uh, little tools. That's probably what I would do, but yeah, open environment is a, is a tough one. Um, another, another way to do it is like, just have headphones on and kind of say like, headphones on means don't talk to me. Um, and then I guess it's up to you to be able to navigate that, but yeah. I have uh, headphones that are not, like they're not noise canceling, but they're okay. And sometimes, because I've I moved from being solo in an office to a shared uh, sometimes I just put on the headphones. There's nothing playing. I just have the headphones on. And it's like it blocks out enough of the noise that I can focus on that task. And I don't wear them all day. It's more like I need to focus on this thing. So I put them on and then I focus. It's like cold before the water. Yeah, it's also cold before it's still me. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you have to be careful about not looking too cold either. Like, you, yeah. you can't ignore someone because you have the headphones on. So you, you, you kind of have to like reiterate every time, like, this is this is my quiet headphone time. Um, and um, and at the very uh, at the very last is um, if they still kind of like push, you can go back to your manager and be like, okay, well, or which, which ones are my priority in terms of work? And then you can go back to the person like, if you want to talk further about this. Uh, I spoke to my manager or my director, and they're saying this is more important. So if you want to like elevate it or put it up the food chain, go talk to them. So like just deflect. Yeah. But. I'm just thinking it depends. Like if you're already so when you say what well, I mean, people walking over to you and just like trying to start a conversation with you, or yeah, while you're working. While you're working. So it's it's, it's funny, right? Like there's a disconnect then between what you think your role is and what those people think your role is. And so, one thing you, like, you're already, it's already too late by the time they're walking. They've decided that you're a person that they should interrupt. So, the headphone thing works sometimes to make people not decide that you're a person to interrupt. I also read a study somewhere that people are some percentage less likely to interrupt a person who appears to be working with their tongue sticking out. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean in a weird way. I mean that, that particular expression that is used in cartoons of like someone working really hard and going like that. I'm it totally actually, yeah. that. <laughs> it actually it, no, I mean you can't it's uncomfortable to sit like that all the time. But people will actually not approach a person that, that if like there's some psychological like biological indication that means I'm busy leaving me alone. I don't know why. But anyway, the if you've recognized the disconnect between what you think your role is and what everybody, what uh, some other people are thinking your role is, you have two choices. One choice is to, is to ask the question you're asking, which is, I think my role is to do this work and everyone else think my role, thinks my role is to handle whatever thing you're handling. So the other choice is to say, okay, there's a role that's not being played by anybody right now, that everyone is def defaulting to me. And then like, like Maxime was saying, you could then maybe take that out of the food chain and say, it seems like we need a, whatever this is, and if you feel like you don't mind, you wouldn't mind playing that role, you could say, I'd like to do this, but then I can't also do this other thing that I need to be focused and concentrating on. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that, like if you're not happy that people are, like if you'd rather be doing the, the role you're thinking of, then yeah, it's probably uh, worth it investigating some kind of change with your Management in terms of even like, can you work remotely some of the time and get stuff done? Mm -hmm. Right, a lot of places will be inflexible with that. I don't know, but. But the good point we're all, I was also thinking if from management we talk about office etiquette and these are some right. guidelines to follow. So it's more like you can have your own guidelines and rules, but people have to respect them. It's better if it and comes from above. communicated how do people know about So I think it's more um, as a change management thing, and then we have uh, open content all of a sudden. Um, even people coming to socialize. Constantly, and it's hard to get back into that focus. So I think we can ask the leadership, yeah. saying these are the, the rules, um, and I don't think it can be kind of one person. No, I don't think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe, maybe I have to have that conversation. <laughs> and I was alluring great comments by the way, or comments. Um, I was alluring about like getting people to power, to get in power numbers. So I'm assuming you're not the only one that's feeling that in your office at the moment. So maybe what you could do is kind of like do a little survey, get some names, see like how many people are feeling that way. And maybe you guys can cluster in a certain area of the room or kind of like present that policy 
to management and then see if you can like influence that some respect. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. I was a little surprised that you said the response time for chat could be zero to two days. Mm -hmm. Because I have uh, trouble managing people who keep pinging me in chat because I have at least four chat rooms mm -hmm. that I have to be in. And it's, uh, it's difficult because of this, like, on one hand, you want to be service oriented and be there for people, but then, like, if they know that you respond all the time, it's like mm -hmm. they always get you. And, like, sometimes I'm in the zone and I'm doing something and somebody will want me to troubleshoot something. And, and it's like, it's very difficult for me to be. Light and say I can't do it now because yeah. so how do you manage like do you, uh, zero to two days seems to me unacceptable. Chat <laughs> is like instantaneous, you know, like they're expecting. Um, I, I guess my philosophy for chat is it could even be like zero to never, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, for for one, I, I, I disable the sound notifications, so I don't get that cue of context change that happens all the time. And uh, the other part is you could schedule when you go check the chat. So maybe chat doesn't need to be instantaneous, but it could be every three hours. So you could decide to have chat in the morning, look at your chats, and then at noon, look at your chats. And then, yeah, it depends on the workflow. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think there needs to be that instant, like not all comments require to be responded right away. So for me, it's kind of like, this, this, this. We're all working together. We're all having like a, um, a present conversation, and then this is kind of like an offshoot comment. So maybe we can talk about it later. Um, if if it, you could also try to explore like certain having certain topics in chat. So like this is kind of like a bigger request to just shoot it by email, mm -hmm. so we can ch make a change channels in terms of conversation. Um, some ideas, but yeah. It's, I think it's also that like maybe you set the expectation now of people that you will respond instantaneously. Whereas like if you set the expectation that like you know I'll check it when I can type of thing, then like because now everyone is gonna want to talk to you by chat if they're like oh this is how I get your response. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> but you have to kind of try and change that expectation then now and okay. be like another thing you can do is like set your status in the chat to busy or away. Oh yeah. Good idea. Then, you know, people don't think you're online and seeing it is the I do that for uh, Steam, like a, a game playing app. You can go up here offline <laughs> so you can still see what's going on. Um, there are people that uh, we use like Jabber or Microsoft Teams, and if people are focused on something and they don't want to use it, they just put them on the stuff. And so when you see that, whether you're trying to initiate a meeting or a chat, or even when you're trying to call them, it shows their status. Um, on my end, I have a lot of content editors that call me throughout the day, and usually I encourage them to call whenever they have a question, mm -hmm. um, because uh, it might be easier to explain on the phone versus email. Mm -hmm. Some of them also are quick wins, so it's all about um, the impact versus the effort. So if something that's going to take you two minutes, just you know, take a break to do it for two minutes, and you know they don't have to wait for two days for you to respond. If not, what I do, I just tell them, send me an email, I'll put it in my priority. So you can give them those two kind of things. You can assess, you can check your text or chat right away and assess the situation. If it's something that's going to take you five minutes, sometimes it's good to take a break from whatever you're doing and go back, you know, fresh eyes to your project. And in that five minutes, you can just do those quick things that, that can be solved right away. So they don't have to wait that much longer. So it's all about you assessing the priorities. I have to re-educate that too because I can try and do that, but then they'll just keep going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So keep yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's where you bring the self-confidence, yeah, self yeah. self yeah. being stern, um, and uh, for project management or like any types of requests, usually I work in uh, Asana, like a, a platform for more like project-oriented stuff, and any request, I just send it, my, like even if it's their request by chat, I'll send myself an email, so it's, like that's how I manage my, my request. So, Everything gets like into two channels, and that's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a really fantastic, slightly old, but still fantastic, and still very relevant book out there called um, Time. It was written from the point of view of system, what we used to call system administrators. So it's called Time Management for System Administrators. It's, it's from O'Reilly. Okay. 
and it really should have been titled Time Management for Technical Workers Who Frequently Get Interrupted. Because <laughs> that's really what it's useful for. And so, whether you're, you can, no matter what kind of work you do that involves needing to be focused for periods of time, you know, and stuff like that, I, I can't recommend it enough. If you just, don't worry about the examples. <laughs> because there's, he gives lots of examples that are very system administration specific. But the, 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 the techniques of, for managing your time, managing interruptions, figuring out other people's expectations, all of that stuff is very, very relevant to actually both, <laughs> both of the situations and a lot of the stuff that my team was talking Cool. Yeah. Well, um, it is 11, so uh, it is break time. But if you have any more questions or comments, feel free to come and say hello. And uh, thank you for attending. Thank you.